So the second part that we're going to talk about is the basic processing of such data. So let's take a look at the basic processing of such data and try to understand what are some of the critical steps that are required for us to extract a meaningful matrix of cell specific expression of genes. And then we'll think about what are some of the challenges associated with this process. So I would separate this process into three major steps. There's a process of when you align the reads to the reference genome, basically that's the idea. Number two, you then normalize because you have so many different cells. So you want to normalize the data. And once you normalize the data, you then want to assign them into particular clusters, right? So the idea of clustering, we'll return to that later, how to perform clustering in a meaningful way. That is the overall kind of uh, review. What are some of the issues that we're trying to address at each one of these stages? So let's first of all talk about this first stage, the stage of preparing the reads, aligning them, and making sure that we're only taking reads that are aligned correctly to the reference. So as in any process of alignment, we will have fast Q files, right? So in this case, we already have fast Q files associated with each individual cell. We then have to align these reads to the reference genome and generate a BAM file, right? What is a BAM file? A BAM file is the same fast Q, but it now tells us the beginning and the end of each read from the perspective of the genome. So you have the starting position and the ending position on the reference genome. Now, instead of using here uh, actual individual reads, we now switch to UMIs, right? And UMIs are adapters for each mRNA. So uh, UMI helps us determine how many mRNA pieces are present in each cell. So it's like an alternative to the read. So instead of counting reads, we count UMIs in each cell. And that gives us a better sense of what uh, level or what abundance of mRNA we actually observe in more of a biological sense than uh, just counting those reads, right? And so here you can see that each read contains the barcode, the UMI, uh, and, and so we count these UMIs. Now, we have thousands and thousands of cells, right? So then the process to count these UMIs has to do with comparing cells to each other, right? And, and the problem typically is that we don't have enough RNA, mRNA material in each cell. And so here we run into some challenges, right? And the challenges are going to be to assign those UMIs correctly and then to have as much data as possible so that we can actually take the high quality data to make biological interpretations, right? Because if I, for example, want to identify a cell type by a marker gene, but that gene doesn't have enough mRNA, it's hard for me to distinguish between low expression and a missing data point, right? And so that is one of the challenges that we're going to run into here at this stage of counting. And so an important part here is to really look only for cells that have a sufficient number of UMIs that come from gene coding mRNA. So typically here, we're going to be looking at just gene expression, not transcript level expression. So an important part here is going to be to fill out only cells that have a sufficient number of genes that I can assign an expression level to them based on the overall number of uh, my gene expression. Let's take a look again at the overall process of getting raw files into a pipeline and getting a matrix at the end. And let's think about what we can do with that matrix after this part. So first of all, we need to identify what essentially are we trying to get at? And we're trying to get a table of expression. So instead of samples, we're going to have genes. So typically in a table of expression, you have genes uh, and, and samples. Here we're going to have a transpose table and we're going to have cells and genes. 
And once we have only for cells that we have sufficient data for those specific uh, cells, once we have a sufficient matrix, we want to check for artifacts, right? And those artifacts are going to, again, help us prepare a better table of expression. And that table of expression will be, uh, you know, as many cells are going to be filled with numbers and not zeros. And that major challenge dependent on these factors of data preparation. Once we have that, just like we do in bulk RNA-seq, we're going to normalize the data because we know that the difference between mRNA levels are not always coming from biological differences. They could be coming from these technical variability issues. And finally, we want to then understand differences between groups of cells. So let's now take a look at how do we go to this downstream analysis, basically will fall into these three major challenges of analysis, clustering, annotation, and analysis of a trajectory. And we'll talk about some use cases where these approaches are going to be most useful. So for clustering, one of the major challenges is going to be how do I, uh, what do I call similarity, right? These are going to be heterogeneous samples and so I have a lot of variation just at the level of expression. I have a lot of variation inside specific genes at the level of expression. And now when I try to find differences or similarities, before I can do that, because in such a, you know, I have, again, tens of thousands of cells here, right? So it's very difficult to work with such complex data. Before I do that, I want to reduce the dimensionality. And we'll talk about two methods, T-SNE and UMAP, to reduce the dimensionality. And then once I do that, I want to perform a specific type of clustering. So depending on the method that I choose for dimensionality reduction, depending on how many cells I have and how complex the data is, I can choose uh, different approaches for clustering. Once I determine that, for example, this is a cluster and this is a cluster, I need to annotate them, right? And annotation means to assign a cell type, typically. So when I want to assign a cell type, I want to select marker genes that are coming from some database, from some publication. And this is a major challenge in single cell RNA-seq, is appropriately assigning a cluster that is based on a statistical analysis of my data set to a particular of tissue, cell, or condition in some cases, right? A cell in a condition. And the final kind of analysis that you can perform in some cases is to try to determine exactly where in a trajectory of development a particular cell group is now in my sample, right? So why is this an important thing and why do we, don't, why do we not do this in bulk RNA-seq? Cells are not static. Cells are dynamic. And I have, let's say, a group of cells, let's say in a tumor, right? Cells are proliferating actively, and they are found in different stages of proliferation. So even though they are cellular cells, for example, they could be in different stages of differentiation. And I want to oftentimes find a process that I could find individual cells that have multiple representations. Now, this is going to be very appropriate for a time series data set where I can take, for example, uh, some progenitor cells and I can see their differentiation over time. But sometimes it's also interesting to see a process in a complex population of cells. And I know that these are all cells from the same tissue, but I know that they're differentiating at different rates. And so I'll find some that are in the beginning and, and kind of toward later stages.